So, this morning, the title of my preach is Just One of the Crowd. In 1992, I was at the Glastonbury Festival with some of my friends, among many crowds of people gathering around stages, and thousands of people were gathered. And in 1993, I went to a Pink Floyd concert in Earl's Court in London. Yeah, Pink Floyd. Wonderful music, really deep kind of music, and an amazing light show as well. But again, gathered with thousands of people. In 2001, I was gathered with hundreds of people at Leicester University for my graduation ceremony. And in 2006, I was at Anfield Stadium, gathered with thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And on that particular day, Liverpool didn't win because England were playing Uruguay. And England did win. But in all those occasions, I was just part of the crowd. I was one face among many. Have you ever been part of the crowd? I'm sure you have. But do you remember what it feels like to be just part of a crowd? Today we're looking at a passage in Mark chapter 3, where the crowds are following Jesus. And not just out of curiosity, but the crowds are following Jesus for a reason. It was because he was healing people. Yet this morning, what I want to, for us to get hold of is that it's okay to be part of a crowd, but Jesus calls us to be more than part of a crowd. He calls us to be his disciples. And we'll be exploring together what it means to be his disciple. If you're in a big crowd, it can feel exhilarating. It's just exciting being there for one reason with everybody else. But it can also feel overwhelming if you're not keen on crowds. But you might be left feeling like disheartened because you don't really know where you fit. Or if you've got any significance within such a large group of people. But the crowd that was following Jesus was there because of the miracles that he had done. We are working our way through the Gospel of Mark, which is Mark's account of Jesus Christ, why he came, who he was, and what he did to save the entire world. We've arrived at Mark chapter 3, and Dave's been looking at some of the earlier passages, but today we're going to be looking at Mark 3 and verse 7 to 12. So let's just read that together. Mark 3, verse 7. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. 
For he had healed many, so all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. So the crowd was following Jesus because of the impossible things that he was doing. To the extent that it, he was drawing people from a wide area, the, the different locations listed in that passage are up to a three-mile walk away. A three-day walk away. Three miles wouldn't be too bad, actually. You could, that's a 5K, isn't it? This is a three-day walk away. So this is basically like somebody coming to the Wirral from Sheffield by foot or from Anglesey by foot. I'm pointing these ways, but I'm not quite sure which way is, where my, which way is Sheffield. Anyone, which way is north? Anyone know? The Sheffield's not quite north, is it, though? That's no, is that north? Okay, so which way is Sheffield. Yeah. Crash. Okay. So if I go through that door, I can visit my daughter in Sheffield. Brilliant. Okay. So they came from a long way. And, and so the, the word had got, got out. But of course, part of the reason they were coming such a long way was because they saw Jesus doing impossible things. They heard about the miracles and wanted to get, be involved and get healing. A commentator on this passage of Mark, Carson, points out that there's this, there's this transition as Mark writes about the life of Jesus from talking about crowds and crowds and how the crowds are interacting, how the crowds were going after Jesus. And the focus changes to being more about Jesus and his disciples, which is a much smaller number of people who were the ones who were really devoted to following Jesus. In fact, the, the very next paragraph after this passage talks about Jesus calling the, the twelve disciples. The word disciple, in the New Testament, the Greek word is mathetaeus, mathetaeus, and it literally means someone who learns or someone who is a pupil. But it also has a, another meaning about coming under someone's teaching. And in the Jewish culture, you had Jewish rabbis who would teach the Jewish law to the people. And they would have disciples who would come under their teaching and would follow them. But a disciple wouldn't just listen. It's not like a teacher in a school, really, because it's, you follow this rabbi teacher and you come under their teaching but you also imitate their life so a disciple comes under someone's teaching and imitates their life and so this is what the disciples who Jesus was calling out from the crowd were going to start doing just to demonstrate that sense of being called out from a crowd I'd like to just do a little experiment or demonstration, sir. So if everybody could stand up, please, if you can. If you can't, don't, please don't worry. <laughs> okay. You are all followers of Jesus. Amen. If this aisle, row, lot could sit down. You lot. Thank you. You are all followers of Jesus. If a central section could sit down. You are all followers of Jesus. If everybody behind David could sit down. (laughs) 
You are a follower of Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Please sit down. Being picked out from a crowd changes something about the way you relate to the teacher. And in this case, of course, the ultimate teacher that the disciples were being picked out to follow was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I remember when I was in my younger years, I would go to church with my mum through the 80s and the 90s. She was a regular church goer. We went to a Baptist church. And, but through those years, although I could see and I could understand a little bit about what this Christianity was about, I really was just one of the crowd. It wasn't until I went to university in 1994, I went to Leicester University, that suddenly something shifted. And I realized that God wanted me. He wanted to pick me out. And it, he wanted it to become personal. I had a revelation that God was my father. Now, we, we know theologically that God is the Father. He is the Father we go, we go to. But there's something shifted in that, actually, he's also my Father. It was personal. So my first question for us today is, is your relationship with God a personal one? Is your relationship with God a personal one? Or are you just part of the crowd? Jesus was drawing a crowd because he was healing people. This is what Mark tells us. There were other reasons and other things that Jesus did that drew the crowds, but Mark here is emphasizing that it was because of the healing. And he tells us that the people who were gathering around him were pressing in on him to touch him, to the point that they had to get a boat. And he was, he was the, the disciples at that point, he was saying, could you help me to organize the crowd because I... I I'm going, to get, I'm going to not be able to minister to them properly or teach them as well because of the crush. And so, and other times in the New Testament, in the Gospels, we read about Jesus using a boat to, do, to just come away from the crowd a little bit, but then to be able to speak. But here, we're told it was because they could have crushed him and interrupted what he was doing, his ministry to them. So the, the crowd were gathering around him to touch him for the healing. Which I think is phenomenal because the thought that all you have to do is touch Jesus for healing to come demonstrates the power of Jesus. There are a few other points in the New Testament where we see the power of Jesus demonstrated in this way. Later in Mark, we read, this is Mark 6, 56, it says, Whenever he came, it's Jesus, in villages, cities, or countryside, basically everywhere, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. They implored him, which means th they said, Jesus, is it okay if we touch your clothes because we believe that, he that we'll get healed by doing that? And then it says, as many as touched him, suggesting that he said, 
Yes, you can do that. And by faith, just by touching his garments, it's, Mark says, many were, were made well. There's another story in Matthew chapter 9, verse 20, where a woman, well, let's read it, Matthew 9, 20, it says, and behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind Jesus and touched the fringe of his garment. Again, simply touching his clothes. And what happened was the woman was completely healed instantaneously. And we're told later in that story that he didn't, Jesus didn't, it wasn't that he felt his clothes tugged that he realized that something had happened, but it was because power had gone out of him, we're told. Just touching Jesus' garments, and, and as, a, as a Jewish rabbi, the, the hem of the garment was touching, it was a sign of respect. But in this woman's case, it was a desperation. She just, if I can just touch, and she was healed. And as the early church starts to grow in, in Acts, we see two other examples of Jesus' power being revealed. In Acts 5, 15 to 16, we read, As a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall on them as he went by. Crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. Peter's shadow healed people. Jesus so was filling the lives of the apostles that his, the authority of the name of Jesus in their lives was bringing healing through the early church. And so Peter here is mind-blowing, really. You imagine it's a sunny day and Peter's walking through the market, uh, walking, walking uh, along a certain route. And people are like, well, that's where Peter walks. Let's put some of our people who need healing along that route. At the time of day when the shadow's going to fall on them, and boom, they're healed. The power of Jesus to heal is phenomenal. You want one more. One more demonstration of Jesus' power. Acts 19, 11 to 12, we read, And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and, the e and evil spirits came out of them. That's in Acts 19, later in the, in the story of the birth of the early church. So again, Paul had this delegated authority from Jesus and the power of his Holy Spirit in his life to, to see miracles happen and healing happen. But I think this um, example is even more significant and, and mind-blowing than the Peter's shadow healing people because of the, the handkerchiefs and the aprons that had been near Paul were carried somewhere else, so Paul wasn't there anymore, and people were healed. It's wacky, but it's in the Bible. <laughs> and this demonstrates just the unbelievably powerful nature of who Jesus Christ is. Now, next week, we're going to be looking at what it means to see healing today and to be a church that moves in healing and expects healing. And Tim is going to speak to us next week about that. And we're going to make an opportunity to invite God to do some healing as we step out in it. If you look at the Gospels, you could say that they're all about healing, because Jesus just heals everywhere he goes. 
but the gospel writers are always very clear that the healing is a sign of something. So when someone is healed, it, there's a signpost saying, pointing in a certain direction. And so what we're told in the Gospels is the healing is a sign of the kingdom arriving. Someone is healed. Hey, look, this is a sign that the kingdom is arriving, the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. It's a sign. And so if we see healing today, what is it? Is it to make life better so that we continue to be healthy? Well, according to the way the gospel writers saw healing, it is today. It's a sign pointing towards the arrival of the kingdom of God. That the kingdom of God is breaking out and it's just a sign of it. And we see many other examples of Jesus working in our lives, doing things. It is not, it's, he loves us and is compassionate to care for our lives. But when his glory is revealed in something, it's because it's a sign pointing to the fact that in the church today, the kingdom is still arriving and breaking out and changing the world. The people in the crowd, they were there because of the sign. They were there because of the sign of the kingdom, but they weren't making the decision to follow the king of the kingdom. And Jesus knew this. In fact, we, we can understand from th that he ended up honing down those who were following him to a large group of disciples, and before the twelve were called, we reckon there was somewhere up to a hundred disciples following him who were devoted, and he picked out twelve to be those who would duplicate his ministry as the church was born after his death and resurrection. But he was very aware of the crowd's motives. In John 6, 26, we read, Jesus says, you are looking for me, not because of the that you saw the sign I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. The miracle here was Jesus fed 5,000 and more people from a single meal. That was the miracle. And so later on, he, he, as the crowd continued to follow him, he was very aware in his wonderful way <laughs> that he just knows what's going on. He was very aware that there are many, many in the crowds who, who simply wanted another meal and to see another miracle. They weren't truly his followers. The evidence of God's kingdom arriving through Jesus, through these healings that he was doing, and, and, and this is where Mark focuses today, but there are obviously many other miracles that Jesus does. We read a little bit about demon deliverance, don't we, at the end of this passage. So there are many miracles but these evidences of the kingdom, these signs that the kingdom was arriving, are part of the story. The fullness, almost like when the dam broke, when the floodgates were opened for the kingdom to break into this world and the church being built, multiplied, spread, as it still is today, was his death and his resurrection. That was the point at which those who believed who he was, who believed what he did, could save them and restore them to God. 
that was the moment when the kingdom fully broke out through his death and resurrection. This is how the true life of the church began. And it's that point when we put our faith in his death in our place and his resurrection to bring us new life starting today and lasting forever. That's when our journey starts with him of being just one of the crowd. No, no. being his disciple. Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to, everything you say, I want to believe in you. I want to hear it. I want to read your words and put my feet on the rock, not on the sand of other ideas. I want to put my feet on your words, Jesus. We want to be his disciples. In this really helpful commentary, Jason Mayer says, Discipleship involves life together. See, the crowds come and go. The disciple learns by living with Jesus. This is, he says, intensive 24 hour a day, seven days a week. And sometimes he goes on, it's easy to forget that we have a similar opportunity today, that Jesus is with us and we must learn what it means to cultivate our fellowship with him, our discipleship to him. You could say, well, I've put my faith in Jesus. I've trusted in what he's done for me. I know that I'm going to go to heaven. So I'll just live my life until that point. But that's completely different to how the New Testament describes life in Jesus. Our culture even tells us that it's, it's up to me to decide how I want to live. Our culture tells us that if I believe in myself, that's enough to give me identity and to stick out from the crowd. But the Bible is very clear. Our only place where we can have identity is when we stand as saved people of God, as people who belong to the very one who created us in the first place. It's only through Jesus Christ in your life that you can have a meaningful life. There isn't another way. There's, I was thinking about this, the difference between the crowd and the disciple. And I want to go through six comparisons of what it is like to be part of a crowd and what it's like to be a disciple. And maybe some of these will, will be more meaningful for you to, to, take, to take on. Number one, the crowd says, we only, we only need to think about being a disciple when we go to church. A disciple says, I am a disciple of Jesus in every part of my life, work, family, and rest. Number two, we may be expecting, but sorry, the crowd says we may be expecting the kingdom to be revealed in churchy gatherings. The disciple says, I expect the kingdom of God to break out in my everyday life through the week. The crowd says, number three, we get a weekly refresh of our Christian life once a week. The disciple says, I will invite the Holy Spirit to lead me every single day. 
Number four, the crowd says, we only trust God when all is well or when he meets our needs. The disciple says, we trust God and surrender to him in every circumstance, good and bad. Number five, the crowd says, we read scripture, we read the Bible as an abstract information that has little, maybe some relevance to our daily lives. Whereas a disciple says, I expect God to speak to me personally as I let the scriptures shape my life. Finally, number six, the crowd says, we, th- we think we have the right, the right to use our time, our money, and our relationships how we see fit, with little reference to God. A disciple says, my time, my money, and my relationships belong to God and are a gift to steward for him. It's such a different way of thinking when you are a disciple of Jesus Christ every single day. Or maybe you're here this morning and you're, you're not sure whether you have given your life to Jesus You wonder, am I left in the crowd at the moment? Well, you could simply look at the people around you, maybe who have faith, and say, well, they all all seem to believe in Jesus and seem to be getting on all right, so yeah, I'm a Christian. I'll be a Christian. However, that's crowd thinking. And actually, if you've not made that step to give your life to Jesus this morning... You need to make it personal. You need to ask the important questions. Why should I give my life up to Jesus? Because it's costly. Is what the Bible says about Jesus Christ true? What difference does Jesus really make in the lives of those who are his disciples? These are the most important questions you will ever ask. The crowds gathered to Jesus. The crowds followed Jesus. The crowds pressed in and came close to Jesus. But through the Gospel of Mark, we'll eventually get, we will get there, to chapter 14, where the crowd shouts, crucify Jesus. Sorry, that's Mark 15. Before they start shouting, crucify Jesus, we read of another crowd that comes at night to arrest Jesus. The crowd, the tone of the crowd completely changes as we get nearer to the cross. How on earth did that happen? I think we were talking about this in life group, weren't we? How on earth did that happen? How did the crowd shift from being all about Jesus to shouting, crucify Jesus? But the whole problem is discipleship. If you are not part, if you are not a disciple of Jesus today, you are part of the crowd. And the problem with being part of the crowd is you can't stay there. Because one day, 
you will be forced to make a decision. And that decision is whether to give your everything to Jesus and become his utter disciple in every part of your life, or whether to say, no, I don't know Jesus. It's too costly. Eventually, being part of the crowd, you will be forced to make a decision. Knowing this, as a church, we need to be aware that the world's thinking of being just part of the crowd, just fitting in, is not enough for us. But we need to be pursuing him. We need to put our lives before him. We need to let, intentionally, the Bible shape our lives more than the culture shapes our lives. So, we've seen how Jesus deals with the crowd. And the funny thing is, we also, we also see he knows. He knows when we just want to stay as part of the crowd. And I know that there will be various challenges for all of us at different parts of our lives where we're like, oh, actually, yeah, that part of my life isn't Jesus's. Every single part needs to be his. When a disciple will follow a rabbi in the in the Jewish times, in the, um, in the New Testament times, they come under his teaching, they stay with him, they copy him, they imitate his life. They don't go, well, I'll just go off and there's a part of my life that I'm, I, I'm just going to live my own way. That's not discipleship, that's stepping back into the crowd. So the two challenges I want us to think about this morning and ask God, God, what changes do I need to make? Step out from the crowd. If you know you're just in the background when it comes to the things of God, when it comes to the things of church, when it comes to the things of being a disciple of Jesus openly through your week, that it's just a background thing. Step out from the crowd. Commit fully to him rather than blending in. F- following Jesus is a daily walk and it's not just on this day. The Sunday gathering here together as God's people is absolutely vital and important and God meets with us but the daily discipleship happens when you get up when you go to bed when you go to work when you meet with your friend when you struggle with a difficult family member when you go through a difficult time where you stop and say Jesus I need you in this moment. Lead me. Be my shepherd. Be my Lord. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. We're going to worship again. Um, So, Graham, would you be kind enough to come and lead us again? Let's stand. We need to have a moment before we worship of surrendering. Maybe there are things that you need to surrender to being Jesus' disciple this morning. That may be that you've 
You've moved away from him being your, the first one in your life. And other things have taken their place. Maybe you've let attitudes, you've let anger, unforgiveness, you've let disappointment take his place in your, at the center of your life. Well, in his amazing, awesome, wonderful, fathering way, he calls to you this morning, come to me, come out of the crowd and come to me because you are my disciple.